All right, hello everyone. Um, hope you're energized after the lunch. Uh, next panel, we're going we're gonna to be talking about the higher history marketplace. My name is Wufi Zhao. I'm the partner at Bloxbridge Consulting. I'm also the founder of our in house data and research platform, the MinerMag, which is fo exclusively focusing on the research of mining companies. So, for the panel, we're going to have a pretty interesting mix of panelists. Um, they each come from different backgrounds of the hash rate marketplace segment. And let's welcome Matt from Luxor, Marco from NiceHash, Sebastian from Blockring, and Thomas from Hash Function. All right, guys, come up. Um, so just uh, to get the conversation started, I think hash rate marketplace is, I mean, the term itself is kind of interesting because a couple of years ago, I don't think there's, not, there's much about this segment of business, but now we have a good mix of product services around, you know, Bitcoin hash rate. And, you know, let's just go around the table. Each one of you can introduce yourself a little bit and about your company's roles and, you know, well, what's special about what's your offering from, from your companies? Yes, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm Sebastian, the CEO and co-founder of Blockgreen. Uh, we are a financial marketplace for Bitcoin products. Um, our main product is a liquidity solution allowing Bitcoin miners to sell forward on their mining revenue um, in order to access instant liquidity. We are a matchmaking marketplace, so we connect Bitcoin denominated capital with miners, and we allow those transactions to happen in a kind of on chain um, fashion. Yeah. I'm Marco Tarman, I'm lead mining manager at NiceHash. Uh, we've been around since 2014, and since then, the core product has been Hash Rate Marketplace. To be precise, it's live on demand Hash Rate Marketplace or Spot Marketplace. And since then, we've been connecting buyers and sellers from all around the world without any contracts whatsoever. Um, Matt Williams, I'm with Luxor. Um, we are a Bitcoin infrastructure company. We do a uh, Bitcoin mining pool, firmware, obviously derivatives, um, and ASIC brokerage as well, and ordinals. It's, it's a hot topic now. Um, I come from a long history of being in traditional finance, um, was part of the team that helped launch Bitcoin Futures when I was at CME Group. Joined Luxor about a year ago. Um, our goal is to build hash rate derivatives for the mining space to have a hedging instrument against their, head, or their hash rate risk. And yeah, so we launched in January of this year. We've seen tons of growth. We have a deep liquid market and happy to be here. My name's Thomas. I'm a little loud. Um, yeah, that's better. Um, I'm a co-founder of Hash Function, uh, co-founder of PubKey NYC. Um, Hash Function is a Bitcoin company focused on uh, the hash rate marketplaces that are, you know, out there in the wild and in development. Uh, we're mostly focused on sort of price discovery. The spot markets of hash rate are the things that we're we're most interested in as we build out um, a suite of uh, swap and derivative products to help miners hedge out a myriad of volatility risks that are embedded within hash rate. Um, I think one difference uh, from some of the other panelists here is we're, we're operating more from the perspective of a, of a buy side. We ultimately you know, understand some of the market dislocations and the need for driving market efficiency across um, some of the subsets with, embedded within hash price generally. Um, and that's largely where we're focused. Yeah. Right. So. Let's get started with the first question. I think, um, you know, each, each company has a different kind of strength in terms of products and services, and it has emerged over the last four or five years. Um, so what was the, basically the driv driver of all this emergence? Like, why did you come up with this kind of services? You know, why do people want to buy hash rate, basically? Yeah, can. everything on the cost side is denominated in dollars or the local currency, right? And everything on the revenue side for a mining operation is denominated ultimately in Bitcoin, but there's lots of volatility risk embedded within hash rate before it's sort of refined or synthesized or you have that Bitcoin anyway. So that's um, one of the reasons why mining in general is 
probably one of the worst businesses on the planet. You're kind of <laughs> stuck in the middle and just at the whims of the market fluctuating. Um, and we're seeing that with some of the products. I know, you know Luxor has a, a, an interesting perspective on, on what happened specifically with transaction fees, with the explosion in demand around ordinals and BRC20 contracts and things like that. Um, but if you're not growing, if you're a mining operation and you're not growing at the rate of growth of the overall cumulative network, you're being diluted out and that's a losing position to be in. So not only do you need the capital up front to pay all the costs, the, the PPA, the operation, the overhead, everything like that, you need to be growing effectively. Um, because up until now, in the absence of you know, a liquid, robust spot market for hash rate, a lot of these derivative products have have sort of taken a back seat. It's very difficult to develop. There are, there are options now, and they're getting you know, much better. Nice hash has been around for, for a while, of course. Um, but there's a lot of different shapes and sizes of miners, on-grid, off-grid, public, private. Um, so uh, a, a lot of uh, diversity for these solutions still, are, I think, are in development. But. Yeah. Yeah, just to add on to that, because you made some good points around like minor risk, right? Like, we view hash rate as a commodity, and if you look at any like commodity, you know, asset class, if it could be, you know, crude oil or nat gas or corn, they all have you know robust hedging instruments for those industries. And if you look at a miner from their risk perspective, they have Bitcoin price risk, they have energy risk, and they have hash rate risk. And you know, to date, like there's lots of instruments for hedging out your energy risk and plenty of derivatives for hedging out your, your treasury risk with Bitcoin, but not so much with hash rate. So for us, we felt like this was an unmet need. Um, we wanted to you know, be accretive to the industry and launch an instrument that people could hedge out their hash price. Yeah, nice hash works a bit different than what you guys do. So we provide on-demand hash rate, which means that the buyer can buy hash rate for 10 minutes if he wants. He can buy one extra hash for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, how long he wants. And I can give you a couple of practical exams, examples why a buyer would buy hash rate on demand. So the first one would be to arbitrage, to do, to do the arbitrage trading with the hash rate. So they, the buyer will buy, let's say, 5% under the break-even price, under the hash price index. Then he will use that hash rate to mine on ordinary pool and get that 5% back and basically earn. Then there are other types of buyers, for example, solo miners, uh, who try their luck by buying huge amount of hash rate for a short time just to get one specific block, for example. So they will buy, let's say, two exa hash uh, for two hours, and in that time they will have a um, certain probability of hitting that block or not. Uh, those are just two examples. There are more, for example, uh, if a miner has a contract to provide hash rate for let's say one month for 100 beta hash and something happens to his farm. Like for example, the, there's a flood or whatever, but he's obligated to provide that hash rate to the, to the buyer. He can use nice hash. Uh, he can buy that hash rate that he's missing in 10 minutes probably. He, he can, in a way it's insurance against uh, not providing enough hash rate. So that's just a couple of reasons why a buyer would use nice hash uh, marketplace. Yeah, if I add something here, um, from our perspective, when we started Block Green, we actually took a bit of a different angle. We mostly look at the working capital angle. So when you're a Bitcoin miner and you want to raise capital, you can go the equity way, which is expensive, dilutive. You can go with debt, which was and still is extremely expensive. And kind of the third lack that we had identified was, well, hash rate, right? Because hash rate is what translates to miners' revenue. And from our perspective, it would, be, it would be a very interesting additional tool to miners if they could actually, based on their future production, get capital. And already exist in many different industries, commodities, did not exist at a time with, with mining. And on the other end of the spectrum, a lot of Bitcoin is out there, not really exposed to any yields, to any kind of possibly to natively um, get returns. And that's how we came to the conclusion that we could build a product that would be based on hash rate, but mostly we're focused to provide working capital to miners at costs that would be much more affordable, much more aligned also with 
their operations because it's Bitcoin denominated um, versus what was existing at the time. Yeah, I wonder like what is the kind of demand for you know from from retail and institutional perspective because we have you know from both sides of the spectrum. So can you guys talk a little bit about you know the, the demand you have seen for hashery kind of related product from both institutions and retails, you know, year to day maybe after the winter is it coming back? Is it like looking good? Yeah, I would say for us, like we're actually pretty heavily focused on introducing this product to institutional participants. Um, we, our product is we operate in a very regulated way, so we're under the CFTC. We do everything through ISDAs. Like we, we, our goal is to inspire trust. You know, either through managing counterparty risk or doing it in a regulated way, and that's how we go to the institutional space. So for now, it's like. While we built this to be a hedging tool, it also gives you synthetic exposure to the, the to the mining space. It's kind of like you guys, right? So, if you want to, you know, be in the have exposure to the mining space, but not actually own the physical equipment, like this is a good synthetic tool for it. And so, you know, if we're going to hedge funds or family offices, like this is an instrument that you can trust because it's regulated, and then, you know, we do margining and all that kind of fun stuff. And so, you know. We view it as like a trust instrument and a way to get into the space without owning the equipment. Yeah, and I would second that completely. Um, we also have taken the angle that it's more of an, at least at this stage, what we are offering more geared towards institutional buyers. Um, to your question, is there interest? I think the interest is, is growing. It also comes with having better tools, more transparency. I mean, um, Luxor is, you know, producing a lot of great content. Also, it helps a lot the adoption of, of products like the different products that we have here. And we feel in the conversations that we have that um, there's definitely an understanding that is growing. There's more appetite. There's an understanding of how this relates to Bitcoin as well, um, which I think is very positive. Yeah, for, for us, it's a bit different again, uh, because we're not focusing only on institutional miners. Uh, back in the day, in 2014, uh, there was mostly just um, retail users, just small miners, people buying the hash rate. Uh, so that gives us a bit of advantage because there's way higher demand for that hash rate. And quite opposite to what you guys have, uh, I guess you guys have the problem with the demand. Uh, we have problem with supply. So. Uh, yeah, we're focusing on both retail and institutional. We don't care. Uh, we don't care if the miner or the buyer is retail user or it's institutional. Everyone can use nice hash. Yeah, I think there's a, a little bit of. I think that expresses a little bit of a bias in the U.S., <clears throat> where uh, the focus is largely on institutional. Like yeah. we have a lot of public Bitcoin mining companies that have access to the debt facilities that Sebastian was referencing, which are otherwise closed to small, mid-sized miners, definitely sm uh, closed to like, you know, solo miners. Um, but large public companies have levers that they can pull on. And I think there's still a lot of bad debt that's getting worked out of the system. You know, BlockFi, rest in peace, Celsius, rest in peace, you know, and, uh, some others. Um, but uh, that, that's not quite over yet. Um, and I think as that gets worked out of the system, we're starting to see a little bit of a swing back and more interest in, you know, hash rate as a distinct digital commodity is, a, you know, a relatively new concept for traditional financial institutions. But there is interest there because there's real value there in a lot of different, uh, from a lot of different perspectives. Yeah. Well, what's your thoughts about, you know, how this kind of market balance between the at-home miners and institutions. I mean, what's your what's your guys' view about you know in the future? Is it going to be more squeezed? I guess margins and profits for at-home miners, small miners, to even participate in the hash rate marketplace. Well, another reason why mining is so difficult when you're a public miner. I'm also on the board of directors of um, of Stronghold Digital Mining. Um, you know, I think public mining companies they're up against a lot that they can't necessarily quantify. You know, retail hobbyist mining miners, like with a couple of rigs in their basement, or a nation state are all competing for the same Bitcoin every 10 minutes. So uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, blind spots, I think, for all, all the, the public mining companies. 
Um, but there are advantages. There are massive advantages as well. Um, it'll be a balance. It always sort of ebbs and flows. Um, there was uh, very little uh, interest in mining in the U.S. for good for for some reasons. Butterfly Labs, like it had some some stank on it for a bit. Uh, and then as China bans, uh, there's you know a, a lot of equipment that first found its way to Kazakhstan and then to the U.S. and I think that's an underappreciated, a uh, little bit of a tangent, but that's an underappreciated component of why the hash rate derivative market is able to sort of take this massive leap forward, because we have much more visibility into where the collateral is. And the collateral underpinning a lot of these contracts, you know, being domiciled in the US as opposed to in China, uh, historically, um, makes some uh, components of the contracts a, a, a bit easier. I would argue that there's definitely potential for the smaller ones to get squeezed, but to me, like the products that are being offered by this group, it gives new tools to, to mid-sized miners where they can, you know, hedge out their operational risk or you know get access to capital um, that they wouldn't normally get through these instruments. And like, I'm looking at a friend of mine in the front row that he, <laughs> he he's thinking about it differently. Right? He's thinking about how to hedge out his whole operation and how to like be more you know revenue focused rather than just straight up hodl. And to me, like. If you have these instruments, it provides you new tools to be viable against the big dogs um, and, and have longevity. But even the big dogs, I think, have learned the ways from yeah, for sure. you know, what has happened the past years. I think there's also an educational part of, of course, the buy side, but also the sell side um, of understanding how to secure cash flows. That being able to hedge revenues, hedge price, hedge costs is actually something that they need to do, even if there's a huddle strategy behind it. 100%. And acting as a long-only hedge fund is kind of you know, very risky. And there's definitely education. And I think the, the mining space is learning a lot. Um, and those tools come at the right time, because there is appetite. There is an understanding of, of the risk as well. Yeah, definitely. I think these tools help with the maturity path of the space in general. Yeah, yeah. I'd agree. Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, Again, we're different, so I don't have such expertise in futures uh, and all that stuff because, again, we're, every, we're focused on spot marketplace, so miner on ice hash is just selling hash rate in real time for each and every share, so I'm not familiar with that stuff. Cool. I will, I will get, definitely get back to that, but I, just another topic that I just want to get some thoughts from you guys about the Orinos and the BRC20 because, I mean, it was good for whatever it's like a week or so, maybe less than a week. The hash price was like a surge, goes up and down. Um, so I mean, just get your, gather your thoughts on this. Like, um, is this something that you would like to see that happening in the future? Like the transaction fees goes up, you know, it's good for miners, but what about the usage? Like there's always like this kind of like debate uh, about these kind of things, so. I think it's still early to see if ordinals are good or bad. For Bitcoin, it's still like just, uh, let's say, a couple of weeks, months. But for miners, I think on the long run, it's good. Because, let's say, in 10 years, 12 years, the block reward will, uh, will plummet. There's going to be like half a Bitcoin reward. And then the miners will need the extra fees. And luckily, there is Lightning Network, which will help Bitcoin with the transactions for like retail users. As you know, uh, Lightning is basically free to do a transaction on, and that's I think that I think that Bitcoin is going towards Lightning adoption. We've seen Binance uh, announcing support and so on. And yeah, ordinals are good for miners, but I'm not sure about the Bitcoin itself. Uh, we'll see about that. Yeah, it's been interesting actually to watch. Like we were looking at through the hash rate index, like the percentage of the block reward that came from transaction fees. And for like the longest time, it was you know, between one and 3%, yeah. right? And then you saw this massive spike you know, over the course of a couple of days where it was like 90%, right? <laughs> <laughs> which is nuts. And obviously, it was like a gold rush for a very short amount of time, and that's great. And then you know, obviously, and it came back down, but you know, it's hovering, I don't know where it is today, but like hovering around 9%, right? So yeah. I think the floor is higher. And, you know, and I think it's like you know, ordinal space you know, gets more efficient, um, you know, maybe that drops a bit, but I, I think generally speaking, you know, I don't have an opinion on Ornals 
you know, as a value, but like for the mining space, like having transaction fees, as you pointed out, like be a bigger piece of the block reward is great. I'd just like to add on top of that that um, another example why someone would buy hash rate is as a buyer notices big mempool of transactions, he just spikes up the amount of high, uh, hash rate he wants, sends it towards a pool, and he has a bigger chance of finding these particular blocks. Uh, so he's paying above break-even price before these high transa transa transactions are confirmed. That's another use case of nice hash. Yeah, inscriptions are just a reality. They're, value, they're, they're valid transactions. Uh, if block space has value at a certain price, it, all of it will be used. So full blocks are a good thing. Transaction fees going up is a good thing. Uh, it's a good thing for miners. It's a good thing for Lightning and Layer 2 solutions. Um, you know, there's good and bad with it. Um, I think that there are some problematic uh, elements to storing sort of the uh, actual inscription data if you're like running a node. Um, it's also, it just is, like it, 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 they're valid transactions. So um, I think it's something that we'll deal with. And I think that the knock-on effects are overwhelmingly positive um, as far as miners are concerned and sort of uh, uh, pushing some of the lower level economic activity to uh, change that it belongs in. Uh, as as a, a, a side, uh, a bit of a tangent as an example, at PubKiwi, except Bitcoin payments, we shut off layer one payments. It's lightning only because it doesn't make sense if you're accepting a Bitcoin transaction to uh, just operationally wait for the transaction to confirm. Um, so I think it makes a lot of different facets of, of Bitcoin far more efficient, um, you know, some of the noise aside. I like the it just is answer. It just is. It's true. <laughs> Valid transactions. We pushed it through. You got to deal with it now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, ordinals is a topic by itself, and the value of ordinals, I think we're not here to debate that, and I actually have no perspective. As you said, they're, they're transactions, they're valid transactions. But I think what happened with the fees and the shift in transaction fees versus block rewards is an interesting perspective into the future, because when you look at the transaction size today on, on Bitcoin, they're actually very small transactions, right? Which means that if you were to look at a model where miners can, can still kind of meet ends meet and, and make money, the size of the transaction happening on, on Bitcoin would need to become much bigger. And that would leave uh, Lightning as a solution for smaller transactions, faster transactions. And I think that's kind of a way to look into the future at how this industry could look like. Yeah, as an alternative, I mean, you know, would you ha when you have sort of the halving schedule roughly every four years, uh, taking some of the bite away from the expected revenue from miners coming out of the, the block reward, the subsidy, whatever, um, there's two sort of uh, assumptions there. The price is either going to go up forever and offset that, or transaction fees are going to take over, or a combination of the two. Um, and without the transaction fees going up and the assumption that you know, Bitcoin is just going to continue to grow to the sky, uh, you're left with some other like, really wacky proposals like you know, tail emissions like Monero has and some other stuff. Uh, Eric Voskel gave a great talk in... Um, in Riga at Honey Badger, he actually took Peter Todd's, uh, it wasn't a proposal, it was more of like amusing, uh, but Eric ended up doing the math behind it and sort of just hit everybody in the face with a calculus class in Riga, which was really fantastic. But I mean, some of the alternatives, if we don't have transaction revenue increasing to offset some of the effects of the, the, um, the halvings, um, you know, we're having difficult com conversations. Yeah, I think the math is quite simple. Uh, every four years, the block reward helps. helps. Uh, so the price of Bitcoin must go must double to sustain the current profitability if need for hash rate stays the same, which obviously, obviously won't. So you have to have the price of Bitcoin grow faster than the halving happens. That would be fine too. I'm not yeah, um, but necessarily against yeah, that scenario. But I mean, obviously it's fine, but... <laughs> you can't count on it. You cannot count on yeah. it. Yeah, so in five years, there's going to be two halvings. Yeah. And you would have to uh, have the Bitcoin price uh, times, what, four? So That's fine. It, yeah, it's possible, but still, in the next halving, <laughs> that still adds up. Yeah. yeah. This is not financial advice. <laughs> How about we do both? 
ordinals and the price goes up. Like, you well, know, demand for block space, transaction fee up, and market price up. Yeah. Well, everyone's happy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I, I do want to come back to the kind of hash rate, uh, kind of demand, kind of uh, set of questions. You know, the Bitcoin price has been kind of come back, coming back year to day, roughly about 30%. Uh, so what's the current like temperature in terms of you know rigs? Um, I mean, you guys deal with this kind of buy side assets. Um, yeah, it walks us through a little bit of temperature. Are we seeing the rigs prices coming back? More demand for new ASICs, um, new six shipping to the U.S., etc. I think there's still a lot of equipment being worked out of some of these bankruptcies, unplugged rigs. Um, the secondary market is. Another th element, I think, that's coming along. Luxor has done great work with that and a host of others as well. Um, but you can just look at the bankruptcy estates from BlockFi and Celsius and see there's a lot of stuff there. And it's very difficult to bid on because you don't know how that specific brick was treated over the course of its you know, uh, career. If it was in you know, a dusty, hot warehouse or uh, in an uh, efficient, I guess, well-managed operation. So I think that that's part of it. And we don't have a tremendous amount of transparency into the primary market uh, manufacturing as well. Like, you know, there's rumblings, some slow down production, seeing that there's a lot of um, inventory on the secondary market. Um, I think losing space at the foundry is a concern, is right? It's sort of use it, use it or lose it. Um, so uh, if they've continued to crank uh, new equipment. There's there's a lot of equipment out there. Yeah, I would say just you know, as you mentioned, like Bitcoin going from 15 to 30, you saw a rebound in ASIC prices, but kind of leveled off. Mm. We're you know range bound for Bitcoin at least, and I think <clears throat> ASIC prices are similar. They've kind of stabilized and they're just hanging out here. And I think part of it has to do with what Thomas was talking about, like glutton supply. There's also a question around capacity to ac acquire large amount of machines from the big players, right? Yeah. And yes, the economics are better, but if you look at cash position and the possibility to borrow at affordable rates, it's not there. So the industry is not actually able to afford that much more equipment. That's number one. Number two, where to put this equipment, right? So we've seen very expensive deals on the hosting side, including revenue sharing, popping up. Um, so I think the economics of investing right now in equipment, if you even have a place to plug them, is yeah, still quite questionable. Yeah, that's a good point. The access to capital is kind of lacking, which makes yeah. it hard for people to buy, yeah. which is where block rate comes in, right? Exactly. Hey. You're welcome. <laughs> but even with, even with capital, you're still going to figure out the capacity first, right? So I mean, even if you have the machines, they're still... You don't have the power. So you need the yeah. power first. So what's what's the what do you think the bottleneck at right now for you know more participants to come in to the hash rate uh, marketplace? Like what is the bottleneck if there's any? It's Miami. First you get the money, then you get the power, then you get the hash rate. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's too easy. I'm sorry. I don't, that was I don't really know how cheesy. I follow up that. It was just way too easy. It was low hanging fruit. <laughs> I think I think it's educational. Some of it, like you know, if we're talking in the realm of our instruments, um, you know, derivatives and and other tools like we have here in this group, there's an educational barrier. Like this space is still, you know, it's a 14 year old space, but even like within that, it's like five years, right? Is you know what you're dealing with. So for a lot of the time that we spend is like going on teaching people like what hedging is and how they should be doing it and how that you know impacts their revenue and their longevity and their solvency and so you know i think and you're seeing a lot of it like it's it's rapid growth and we're seeing with like the pub codes that are hiring the expertise and building out hedging strategies and the mid-tier miners that are smarter you know educating themselves or hiring people and so you know a lot of it's just educational and getting people up to speed on you know how these instruments can help them yeah, when you, ed you say you kind of educate these potential institutions to get more involved, like what, is there any like, good use case to you know, lay out what's, in the, what's the pros and cons for them? And you can walk us through a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, like you said before, like, hedging exists in every major commodity cl 
class that exists, right? And it has for several decades. And so, I mean, for me, when I talk to people, I can just point to the example of like a farmer that's hedging against his crop, or a, you know, a producer, or you know, there's plenty of. If you go to like an oil and gas company, and they're, you know, if they want to go get financing, you know, they have to show that they're hedging out 60, 70 percent of their production before anyone will even talk to them. And so, I think the space is probably going to get to that same level. And so, yeah, there's lots of tangents and anecdotes that you can draw upon in other commodities. What do you think? What do you think they're? What do you think they? Besides education, what is stopping them from being well involved, engaged? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Like one, you know, it's a hodl culture, right? So a lot of miners were, you know, indoctrinated into getting machines, mining Bitcoin, and holding on to it forever, right? And so like changing that mindset. Uh, for the long term, like you know, we like to joke around and say, but it's true. Like hedging enables hodling, and so like that, you know, that's one barrier is just cha changing the mindset a bit. Um, education, like I talked about, um, you know, and some of it's, you know, there's capital constraints when you're trading derivatives as well. So that, that's a piece of it. And then, you know, I know for us, like you know, I mentioned the regulation, like wrapping your head around what that entails can be tricky too, but. And the educational part is quite true because we all get the same question all the time. Why would somebody buy hash rate? That's yeah. the number one question. Exactly why. All of us get when talking to miners. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you explain them why? I, I explained before, like solar mining, uh, from my perspective. So we have more use cases, I guess. Uh, I'm not quite familiar why. I mean, you can explain how, why. Yeah, sure. I, I think, as you mentioned, right, there's an educational part on being able to explain to miners that this is in their interest, um, that actually it's in the end more upsides, more free cash flows. Um, that's one aspect of it. And it's also making them, I want to say believe, but showing that there is actually buy side. I think for the yeah. Yeah. past years, some solutions have tried to go about building derivatives or similar products, but there is just not demand or no sizable demand. And so that perspective kind of slowed down, I would say most of the company's trying to build that. Um, today, the way we approach it, I think it's you know, from a very Bitcoin-focused angle. Um, the buy side is looking at getting Bitcoin yields, so they want to deploy Bitcoin to earn on their Bitcoin. The same way you would stake you know, on other L1s, you can actually provide liquidity to the companies which are securing the network, and you'll share a share of their revenue with them. And that is a very trivial, simple way to explain it, but that's actually the way we were managed, but we managed to onboard liquidity providers that were quite sizable. Um, yeah, I think it's um, it, with Bitcoin. You know, broadly speaking, it's about where the audience is coming from. So, uh, the energy industry in Texas has glommed onto certain things like quite quickly, right? Like they 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 get it because of the analogies to uh, oil and gas mining, new projects, financing, things like that, the, the need to like hedge out certain risks, but also the energy market in general. Um, so there's a little bit more domain expertise to work with when you're explaining some of these concepts than uh, I would say just pure sort of financial institution, like legacy thinking, yeah. like in New York or London. So um, and I think that that's sort of been expressed in New York State's approach with the mining moratorium as opposed to the proliferation of mining in, in Texas and some of the support that they've gotten there. Both are complicated topics and we could go on about that. But um, you know, I think it's where people are approaching this from. And as the market gets more developed, there are more touch points and there are more potential hooks to, uh, to explain what is pretty complicated. Like, you know, I think there are a lot of mining operations that don't fully under, understand some of the volatility risks that they take on on a daily basis. Um, they do now. Some of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The last 12 months has been a pretty big educational yeah. period. Trial by fire. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Learning for sure. Um, but when, when, when that's the case, then you know, I think expecting uh, other like, really critical potential stakeholders, you know, debt facilities, you know, uh, uh, ways of financing expansion or new operations entirely, is, um, it's a tall order. It takes a lot of time. And it's still pretty young. Um, I, like I said before, I think a, a major unlock was the China ban for US mining. And 
I think it's still going to be you know a year or two before we start to see some of the you know future stakeholders like get it and get involved. Yeah, I I think you mentioned like next year's halving and also come up come up a question about you know I think in 2020 we had uh, like the ASIC had a new generation like the S19s and before that the previous halving we had an S9s. Um, so we d we're not so sure about you know, what's going to come next year. So in terms of that, are you guys optimistic about you know, next generation of chips coming out around the halving time? I mean, if not, how do mining comp operations you know, cope with the uh, halving? Because you know, hash pricing is going to drop. And if without another leading generation of ASICs, um, what are we going to do? I think that uh, we, for now, we reached that, uh, I think the ASICs right now are around five nanometers. And we reached that point where we got the most out of efficiency. Uh, and right now, the water cooling is helping us increase the effic efficiency. Mm -hmm. It's not the chip that does the better efficiency. Right. So the next step, step will be three nanometer chip. And this will be the next efficiency gains. That's when we will see the efficiency gains. I believe so. Yeah, I think that's right. Like we're seeing people not necessarily like not waiting for more efficient machines, but like trying to increase the efficiency of yeah, the machines, with, right? So with like immersion cooling or yeah. PSU. Or yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's how they increase the Yeah, exactly. Well I think what's interesting though, if you did see another wave of more efficient machines, what what you see after that is a dramatic increase in network hash rate, yeah. right? So it's not like it's great for everyone, right? I mean it's great for yeah, the network, yeah, but it might not necessarily equate to more money for miners. Yeah, exactly. Sure. If it increases for everyone, it's yeah, right. yeah. If only one had access to it, that'd be a different story. But exactly. Yeah. I think the, the driving factor to more efficiency and, and network hash rate in general is going to be hash price. What we see is that as hash price increases, if it does, then network hash rate will catch up, and the investments yeah. into like renewing fleets. Uh, building more efficient infrastructure is going to be driven by hash price. And That's if this point. happens, yeah, I think. I mean, if we look at S9, uh, people were using S9s for, I mean, even now, people are still using them. Like, not many of them, but still it's been, what, six years since they were released? And I think the same will happen with S19s, because they're like this breaking point from the previous version in the efficiency terms. So we were going to see a lot of S19s for a long time. Yeah, I would agree. I think uh, it goes back to that um, relationship between the primary market and the secondary market. I think that there's still a lot of equipment that'll get plugged in. And when we see, uh, I think, more nation states coming online that don't necessarily pay for power the same way others do, um, you know, that's going to change the dynamic completely. You can run S9s if power's free yeah, exactly. as long yeah. as you want. But you don't see S, what were the next uh, series, like S12 was there? The, oh, the fives? No, they're probably, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, I mean, you yeah, know. Exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. So S9s were the breaking point yeah. for that era. Yeah. So they're still like used. It was a great device. That was yeah. like the Toyota Tacoma, or like yeah. AK-47. Yes, <laughs> that's the quote. You big um. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have five minutes left, so I'm just going to have like two last questions for you guys. Um, you know, the first is, uh, what is your projection of the hash rate to go by the end of the year? Any, any sense? Up. <laughs> Next. <laughs> well, the question was where hash rate yeah. would be. Yeah. So we've actually dug into this pretty deep, and we've done uh, a lot of modeling about difficulty forecasting. and. Um, I'm just gonna chill our product. We're actually <laughs> for, uh, we're gonna be doing a premium version where we do difficulty forecasting for people on mm -hmm. a uh, quarterly basis. But we, we look at it. We have a new method for um, forecasting on it that's included in there. And we look at you know like the flat case, the bull case, the bear case. So based on those, I think our flat case, you know, assuming Bitcoin stays roughly around here, is like four ten, four fifteen. Um, the bull would be like four fifty, and the bear is somewhere in like the three sixty range. What is, what is the variables that lead to that? Well, conclusion? obviously Bitcoin and then transaction fees contributes to this as well. Um, but if you subscribe, I'll let you know. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, yeah. I think the difficulties will just increase from now on. Uh, I don't think there are any miners that are shut down. Uh, I mean, at least not in such scale that it would it would make an impact on the difficulty. But there are miners building up farms, as far as I hear here. Uh, there is a lot of new sites building, and I think the difficulty is going to go up. Yeah, barring, look, uh, I, I think difficulty is going up. Uh, like Black Swan events, this 30% like brain dead proposal, 30% tax on US miners, right. that's probably not going anywhere. If it did, it would be a de facto ban. Like So that would be a lot of hash rate coming offline. Uh, for a short period. Yeah. It would but, come up I mean, somewhere. But look at the China ban. Yeah. Even the China ban, like, you know, there was, there was a bit of a cliff, but uh, it, Bitcoin's resilient. Yeah. It, it'll be fine. It'll be up. But what if the two of the biggest economy banned it? Why now? That's a great question. <laughs> I think there's two very different answers. I don't know if anybody else wants to... Um, Look, I think I think that the the Chinese model was probably more about oversight and control, and like this was one fell swoop. Um, I would bet that a lot of hash rate, you know, in China has come back online, uh, whether that's in special economic zones uh, with sort of transparency for the government, or has turned into more of like a cockroach miner approach. Um, I think hash rate has come back online. I think you know in the U.S. it's you know. Uh, the, the Biden proposal was clearly like to bridge a gap in the budget, and it was just like, let's go get it from them. They're not that popular. Well, it's, it's like the financial <laughs> transaction tax in traditional markets. Like, it's just, yeah. hey, here's some money we can yeah. steal. Yeah. But they also, the, the Biden administration in particular had just, had just greenlit um, uh, the oil pipeline in Alaska, which really pissed off a large you know, portion of their, you know, green uh, constituencies. So this is then turning around, you know, our friends at, at Greenpeace and Ripple Labs that have been spreading a lot of, of uh, uh, stuff about Bitcoin being environmentally unfriendly. This was, this was a bone for them as well. So it, it's stuck in the political machine. And hopefully, I'm an optimist with that because uh, I think it'll just sort of like muddle through some yelling and screaming and not like have anything. Well, you're, uh, you're going to end up just driving innovation out of the U.S. Yeah, I just don't think it'll come to pass, though. That, that, that 30%, it, I, I would sure. put a low likelihood on. But if that happens, then that would mean, meaningfully affect, you know, year-end hash rate for sure. Any other thoughts before we close up? Well, I have one last question. If, if you, the, any of the audience here, either from like personally, like individually, or a company, they want to participate in the hash rate marketplace, do you guys have any advice um, about mistakes that you, they should avoid? I think the, the mistake that they're avoiding, they should avoid is not participating in these markets. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for us, and I, I mean that sincerely, like I think you owe it to yourself to acquire the tools that'll help you. You don't have to use them all the time, you know, and you don't have to hedge your entire production or, you know, like, but have the tools, educate yourself on the tools so when the time comes and you need them, they're there. Yeah. And test different solutions. Yeah. I think you need to be yeah, innovative, try things, see what yeah. works for your company. Yeah. If there are any miners, if you're not using nice cash, you're missing out. The pay rates are five to ten percent higher, so that's the first mistake. I already right. said mining is one of the worst businesses on the planet. Run for the hills. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks. It's been really enjoy talking to you guys. Um, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, thanks, Wolfie. <laughs> Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee, a city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.